Francis E. Bay Pock. Uh, we're talking about the end of the Morocco tour and then on to SAC headquarters at Offutt Air Force Base. First of all, uh, just say again what, what your squadron, what, what your position was in Morocco, and then how it fit into the overall Air Force or SAC structure. Well, I was the uh, division uh, special weapons officer in the uh, war plans unit. <coughs> And uh, we took care of, of uh, making sure that the bases were capable of handling B-47s. And uh, that, that was our main, main job. Mm -hmm. Handling B-47s and the nuclear weapons that went with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, but within, within the overall Air Force structure, that, who, did that, who, did that, who did you report to? We reported to 15th Air Force Headquarters, which was in Spain, Madrid, Spain, and 15th Air Force reported to uh, SAC Headquarters. Okay, in Omaha. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. okay, now we're finished with your tour in Morocco, and what year is this now that you're leaving Morocco? 1958. And uh, where are you going next? We're going to Omaha, Nebraska. Okay, SAC Headquarters. SAC Headquarters. And to take up what position? The uh, Special Weapons Officer in the uh, Planning Division. <laughs> In, op in operations. Mm -hmm. Still the same job, my, just at a higher level. Higher level. Mm -hmm. You're basically as high as you can go now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Unless I go to a USAP headquarters. Uh -huh. Now, at, uh, prior to this time, had there been a, uh, any sort of joint planning amongst the different services with regard to... Not, uh, not at this time. That didn't happen until the, uh, two years later in, in uh, 1960. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 1958, tell us what, what you're doing and, and how you're doing it and that sort of thing. Well, I'm just uh, uh, doing the uh, war planning business, the uh, special weapons part of war planning, uh, making sure that the different uh, bases had their weapons by moving them around every time we changed the war plan. That was my main job, Rec recommending what weapons were available uh, to each bomb wing. Mm -hmm. I wrote a top secret uh, uh, plan for that each year and submitted it. Mm -hmm. who, was, who was your boss in, in, at Omaha? My boss was a full colonel by the name of Semenac. Mm -hmm. And uh, our big boss was a, a major general by the name of Eisenhardt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And ultimately they all reported to, to the head of SAC who was? Well, they reported to Director of Operations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... Uh, who, in turn, reported to uh, General Power at that time. Okay. Who, who was the head of SAC? Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> and how, how were you doing the plan? What was the mechanics of it? Well, the mechanics of it was we had so many weapons of, of different types. Mm -hmm. And we made the uh, uh, decision as to what wing would get what type of weapon as a result of that, then they were targeted with that type of weapon. Mm -hmm. And I guess th this plan, was it driven from above with regard to, to foreign policy and then strategy and then the strategy you know, dictating the, 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 the plan? Was that kind of how, was it kind of top down? Uh, yeah. Uh, it was kind of driven though by uh, the capability of the uh, aircraft and mm -hmm. the weapons they had, mm -hmm. which was then w what they used for making the plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, were you getting intelligence with regard to uh, Soviet capabilities? I assume you're getting intelligence all oh, the time. All the time, and, and, and the where the generals were and their movement of their forces. We got that every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how was that acquired? Was that mostly, at that time, do we have any satellite capability? Was that mostly human human intelligence? No, we had satellite capability at that time. In fact, that's the way we found out that the uh, Russians were moving uh, moving uh, missiles into Cuba. Right. Mm -hmm. the same same capability. Mm -hmm. uh, at this at this point, were you using computers yet? Yeah, we were. I was using a computer. Uh, I had the complete inventory of uh, all SAC weapons. And I had to keep keep that inventory, and uh, it was uh, I had to go to the uh, computer room and wire up the uh, computer. Uh, it took me about three hours to to print it out. It was on cards, the old 
card system. Uh, later on, we got the 465L system, and it'd take me th uh, about uh, 30 minutes to do it. Now, once, these, once a week as opposed to three days. Were these uh, IBMs? Yeah, mm -hmm. 465L was an IBM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at, at, were you actually doing the war plan on the computer at this point? Yes, we started doing it at this point, yeah. When, okay. when we became a joint organization, we did, yeah. Okay, well, okay. Let's, let's go up to that. Well, uh, that was, you, becoming a joint organization was before or after Cuba? It was the same time as Cuba was going on. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. well, let's do the joint part of it first. So, okay. so at, at what point was it decided to bring all the services together in a single war plan? Well, actually, it was Eisenhower uh, that uh, decided to do that, uh, President Eisenhower. <laughs> and uh, then, of course, he left office. And, but that started at all the Joint Strategic Target Planning Group. Uh -huh. And uh, so take, take me through that. How, 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 did that. how did that get started? How did it work? I think there's a funny story with regard to the computer plan. Uh, Tell that oh, story. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we the first time that we did the plan, we got all through, and uh, then we tried to run it uh, as a test, and it just started out and didn't get very far, and it stopped and wouldn't go any further. So we spent about three days and three nights trying to figure out what was wrong and couldn't. So they sent in a, a mathematician from. Uh, California. He, he was from one of these think tank type places. And he told us to go all, all on home and get shaves and get get baths and come on back and we did. And he says, okay, now run it. So we ran it and it went right through like it was supposed to. And he, we asked him, well, what happened? He says, well, you showed your start refueling point, but you didn't show an end refueling point. <laughs> It was that simple. So your planes just kept refueling in midair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't go further. <laughs> they couldn't go any further. They ran out of fuel. Now, was there an issue there of getting, uh, of getting him a clearance to come in and look at this? Oh, thing? he already had a clearance. He already had a clearance. Yeah. These people came in about once every three months and, uh -huh. and told us how to write the war plan. And of course, they didn't know which end of a gun a bullet came out of. Right. Knew nothing about air refueling, and uh -huh. and uh, they uh, would talk to us what we were doing. What's your job? You know, and I had two guys assigned to me and what what do you do and so forth. And I, I told them everything I could uh -huh. up to top secret but not not the uh, real details of, of uh, the inventory as an example. So they'd go on back and, and write and come on back and and they would tell us what they wrote and we'd say, We didn't tell you that. <laughs> they didn't understand. Yeah. They just flat didn't yeah. understand. Uh -huh. Now, were these guys from the Rand Corporation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They ran, ran yeah. guys? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Very smart, very nice guys too, but yeah. they they did not have the experience. They didn't know what refueling was. They right. didn't know what a bomb was. <laughs> mm -hmm. they, they were just try, trying to write a plan, the right. computer part of it. Right. And so they got a little bit disgusted, so they sent us off to computer school. Now, I was going to say, either send you to computer school or, or put some computer people permanently on staff with you guys. Well, that didn't any good either because they wouldn't have known anything either. Well, they would learn over time. Yeah. So they made uh, uh, they made programmers out of us, and we programmed our individual parts then, uh -huh. and it ran fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so this is and this was to create what they call this uh, the SIOP. What's the, what was the SIOP? Single single integrated operation plan, where all of the nuclear weapons were put into one plan, and the idea was that one wouldn't knock, knock an airplane out of the air or something like that because it wasn't, wasn't targeted right. right. So th we targeted all of the weapons, and we had, of course, over 95% of them sacked in. Right. And uh, the few that were, were the uh, uh, nu nuclear force in the uh, submarines in the Navy, and then the Navy had some aircraft too. But, yeah, and I learned the concept of what they call fratricide. In other words, if you have two weapons coming out of target at the same time, they can kind of cancel each other out. Exactly right. And leave the target there. Yeah. Okay, so that has to be avoided. And of course, the, the big thing was to figure out, of course, we knew what the targets were, but it was to figure out the hardness of the target. Right. And uh, so 
after figuring out the hardness of the target and how it was defended, then it determined how many weapon systems you would put on that target and the priority of the targets. Now, the hardness was something that, would you get information on that through satellite imagery, uh, human intelligence? Yeah, all, all of those things would uh, were fed into it. And uh, the uh, some targets, of course, you if they were underground, why you would set the bomb off right on the ground. Others, you set off in the air. <laughs> Yeah. Um, now at this time you're still flying when you can, right? Oh, all the time, yeah. Okay. Flying to the flying to the Pentagon and briefing the air staff, and right. mm -hmm. and so you you would you just simply say to the guys, I'll fly the plane so I can get the hours, so I can kind of kill two birds with one stone, or what? Well, they would uh, they would take the staff, and of course we'd go on the airplane and fly it. Uh -huh. We didn't have we didn't have extra pilots for for that. We flew the airplanes. So that you were maintaining your flying status that way. Yeah, mm -hmm. flew C forty seven, C fifty fours. And how, how and so this is how many your flights. So in the last session, you talked about uh, in the Suez crisis, you were about to fly the mail plane. Yeah, C forty seven. No, was that all? Were you doing that just to maintain your your, your pilot status? Is that one way to make? Yeah, it? and it was a, it was required. It was a mission of fifteenth Air Force, uh, fifth Air Division. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. We would take our mail, take it to New Sewer, pick up the Ben Greer mail, take it to them, bring their mail back to New Sewer, which was going back to the United States, and we'd pick up our mail and bring back to City Slimane. So there were three stops. I mean, was that was that the best? thing for the weapons officer to be doing? <laughs> <laughs> no, but somebody had to do it, and you didn't have that many pilots. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And it was a way of maintaining your flight status yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. You also, I, I think, let's get back to that, because that's something we didn't discuss mm -hmm. yesterday. I mean, this was a time when the the Moroccans were actually rebelling against the French colonialists. And, and well, that's when we first got there, yeah. Uh, that the war, was, the war was going on, and they were kicking the French out, and so we couldn't be traveling uh, on the ground at all much. And uh, we were living off base, which was dangerous. And uh, we lived off base for about four months before we could get on base. <laughs> and we didn't go off, off base very much. Uh. And you said that was dangerous because you could be mistaken for French. Really yeah, mm -hmm, exactly. There was only one American killed, and that was because he ran a roadblock unknowingly. Because he had been at the base at uh, at bingo or something with his wife and mother, and and uh, he just happened to be killed. Mm -hmm. right uh, and but you took some small weapons fire, didn't you? you well, know. yeah. When um, when they were kicking the French out, why they'd get reports that a particular uh, family in a farm was uh, being attacked, and so they would ask me, like, if I was in the air, if I would go investigate and so I would not going too far out of the way and uh, went down low enough to see dead people in the farmyard and got shot at and got holes in the plane uh -huh. yeah <laughs> were, were, were you interested in returning were you able to return fire if you wanted didn't have anything to return fire with <laughs> <laughs> so you just got out <laughs> yeah um, just yep. just evaded as much as possible uh -huh. um, now, going back to Offutt uh, and, the, and the PSYOP and the Joint Strategic Target Planning Group, um, the, um, let, let's talk about Cuba. Okay. No, well, first of all, you, your, your, your job is in the so-called underground. Four stories underground. Four stories, that's where your office is. Mm -hmm, yeah. And this is where the famed red telephone was. Right, exactly. The SAC command center. Is it, was right, it was right next to our office. We. Uh, <clears throat> They had two-story high maps, mm -hmm. and we could roll them. We would roll them into our area for targeting, and they would go into the control room, which was right next door, mm -hmm. on tracks. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is the hardest of hard targets <laughs> on our side, probably. Mm -hmm. Probably doesn't get much harder than this. Well, <laughs> that, that was a funny story. It was I was uh, sent to. Uh, the Pentagon to defend the request for a new new type weapon, mm -hmm. and uh, so the uh, the guy we met with had been uh, with uh, the government in the use of uh, nuclear power for peaceful use, mm -hmm. and he was now in the Pentagon and he was a 
assistant director of of, uh, of operations for nuclear weapons, and so he he challenged us. He said, "How do you know, you know, how good your system is?" And he said, "Well, we have circular error prob probability. We practice that all the time, and then we know the hardness of the targets." And he said, "No, you don't," <laughs> which was true. <laughs> he, said, he said, you don't know the hardness of the target. He said, you don't even know the hardness of SAC headquarters. You say it's 15 PSI, but you really don't know. And that's true. But his argument was, you don't know what you're doing. Uh -huh. So, so he, he refused to approve it. We got it approved. But uh, I'd gone to, uh, to uh, Albuquerque. Uh, and to defend it twice, and we eventually got it, got it approved, and got actually got the weapon uh, eventually. Uh, um, but he had his argument had merit. Oh, sure it did. <laughs> he wasn't an idiot. <laughs> uh, I was the uh, the pilot that flew the airplane with the other two guys, and it was it was funny because. One of them, his name was Wolf, and the other guy's name was Fox. <laughs> and you're a hawk. So we had Hawk, Bill, Wolf, and Fox. But, uh, and one was from planning, and the other guy was from, uh, from materiel. And, but I did all the talking because they didn't know exactly what was going on too much. And uh, so I said to him when we got all through, and I said, have you got a job for us? He says, what do you mean? I said, well, we're going to get fired when we get back. <laughs> he says, no, no, you're not. No, you're not. He sent a beautiful message back to, directly to General Power and told him what a great job we'd done so we wouldn't get fired. <laughs> <laughs> so General Power sent you to, to Washington to get a, a system approved and you came back without getting approved. Yeah. <laughs> By that. him, anyhow. <laughs> yeah. um, how, many, how often would you fly to Washington, to, to the Pentagon? Probably about once a month, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Coordinating the plan and the we weapons requirements. And, and, and at this time, what were the weapons that were in the arsenal? What, what were the weapons that you had at your disposal? What different types? Yeah. Oh, we had quite a few different types. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, but at this point, what was the? I mean, were the what what missiles were in the arsenal at that time? Were they were they strictly? We didn't we didn't have any real missiles. The Atlas was just coming in. Okay. And uh, but we didn't get the Titan II, for instance, until 1963. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's when you left Omaha, right? Yeah. yeah. So really, during your time at Omaha, you're dealing primarily with, with airplane-delivered uh, yeah. weapons. Yeah. B, uh, B-50s, B-36s, mm -hmm. B-29s. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is before Atlas, this is before Titan, this is before Minutemen. Yeah, they were, they were being tested at Vandenberg. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, all right, Cuba. Um, how, how did it start? How, where were you? How did you hear about it? What, what? Well, I was in, in the basement or doing my job, and we started getting intelligence about uh, what was going on in, in Cuba. And we were getting briefed daily by the intelligence people. And uh, <laughs> this, of course, caused a, a change of plans and a flurry of, of uh, hard, very hard work. Mm -hmm. Because we, we wrote two plans. We wrote one for conventional weapons and one for using nuclear weapons. Oh, so you're okay. You're doing conventional weapons too, then? Yeah, we oh. did, did that for planning. And uh, the uh, problem was was to get to get the aircraft uh, changed over from uh, nuclear weapons capability to to uh, uh, just conventional weapons because they were different. Different, right. different uh, way to, to carry them and drop them. But so the, the idea being here that that you didn't want to be sending nukes 90 miles away from the U.S. border, or that conventional weapons were good enough to do the job. Yeah, both? yeah, conventional weapons could 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 do the job. Yeah, but we wrote it for both. And mm -hmm. and as I say, this was a big big flurry of 40 days in the underground, and it was a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the uh, the, the, the crisis itself was initiated by this intelligence. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the 13 days. No, not the crisis. The mm -hmm. crisis was, was started by the Russians. Right. No, what I'm saying is that, but that, that, because uh, I'm trying to remember my own history here. Uh, the crisis was initiated by the first intelligence that came in, correct? 
well, if you want to put it that way, I put it the other way. The, the Russians created the crisis. Our intelligence told us that there was a crisis. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but so the moment the intelligence came in, the that's that's when that's when it all started. Yeah. Then we realized that we had to do something. Right. And there's so so then you had to alter the plan to take out to be able to take out these sites. Right. Uh -huh. if, if the Russians didn't remove them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Uh, and and so then that meant converting weapon systems to conventional because you, you weren't going to... Yeah, need. converting aircraft to con be able to carry and drop conventional weapons on, mm -hmm. because they were all configured for nuclear weapons. Okay. Now, were these aircraft mostly lo located all over the place or in Florida or...? No, we had certain... We only had certain... It didn't take that many, so we only had certain mm -hmm. wings that we changed the configuration of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there was never a... a there was never a nuclear option considered simply to take these weapons out. Oh, yeah. Sure there was. To, to, to drop nuclear weapons on Cuba? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you had both a conventional and a nuclear option. We had both plans. Uh -huh. Okay. We briefed both of them to the, to the general who then had us brief the air staff. Okay, so your initial briefing was with whom? Was with the uh, sink sack. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Do you remember the general's name? Yeah, it was General Power. Oh, General Power, okay. So you personally were involved in that briefing? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and so you're basically telling him what the options were? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Telling him what we could do and how we could do it and how long it would take. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, we were getting daily intelligence. We, we had, if you remember the U-2, mm -hmm. guy was shot down. Right. And they were, they were taking pictures of the capability of installing the missiles. Mm -hmm. So we knew what we had to hit, where they were. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then Powers took you along to brief his seniors? No, no, uh, no. We we briefed the air staff. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, well, you uh, you briefed Powers first, mm -hmm. and then the air staff. And he approved. He approved the plan, and then we we briefed the air staff. Now, who was the air staff? What do you mean by that? Well, this is the uh, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff at. at at the uh, Pentagon. Okay, and was Powers along with you when you did that? No, no, okay. he wasn't. They they came out and got a briefing. Well, we didn't. Came, we didn't. Office. Yeah, we didn't have time to go. To okay, run. and so who was the most senior person in that case? That came from the uh, Pentagon. Pentagon. I don't know. Would he have been senior to Powers? No, no. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So the most senior person you briefed was was Powers. Was four star general. Yeah. Okay, and uh, presumably then uh, on up the line to the. Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Secretary of Defense, and the President was eventually getting this, mm -hmm. this yeah. information because the President, President Kennedy, presumably knew what his options yeah. were. And of course, he he uh, is the one that made the decision uh, to uh, put the blockade in, right. and that, that was a funny story. Uh, and hang on a second. I'm going to turn this off. 